been following us for a little bit, you kind of know, like, uh, I'm just not interested in just good, a good sermon, good little messages. Like, I, I like stuff that works. Yes. And, and if you're like me, you know, I was the, I was the good little church boy growing up. Uh, I grew up in church where, you know, we didn't do Chris Tomlin, we did like John P. Key, and so I was the drummer. I was the white, the white kid up there with a lone white dude, and I loved it. I, I love, I love music. Love playing the drums, and I love the Hammond B3 and all that kind of good stuff. And, and uh, so the thing that kept me in church was was music. Uh, it wasn't because I was seeing stuff, and that was the thing that was really causing me to drift away from church because my whole life I heard that God was good, but I didn't see any good God in my life. Uh, I saw my parents always, you know, in the area of finances, I saw my parents always giving and tithing, but we were broke as broke could be. I mean, I grew up in a single wide mobile home. I remember when we first got, <laughs> we were first got in this one mobile home, and, and my parents didn't even have enough money to get water run uh, from the street to the mobile home, so there was a time we were doing sponge baths at night. But I'm seeing my parents giving and tithing, and so I'm not seeing any of that working. And... And then I didn't see any miracles. I'm sure some stuff happened, but I was in church Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. My, my dad was on the board, so you know, we were there for that. And then there was uh, uh, band practice on uh, Monday nights and prayer service on Thursday nights. I was at church all the time. So there should have been something that I saw as a kid and I didn't remember anything. And so it led me to when I was 19 years old, I went off to school, I wasn't made to go to church. And uh, the church I was supposed to have been going to in Dallas, I was playing basketball at the school. And I just lied to him. I told him I couldn't be there. I uh, did that for like nine months. I was just, I was really questioning God, are you even real? Which was sad because I grew up in a good Christian home, great parents, uh, solid church. Anybody that was a big name came to that church back in the 80s. And, and uh, but I just, I was really questioning if God was even real. Um, and it took me having a, a supernatural experience with him about nine months later, found out he was real. And then that led me down this path of, okay, well, if me being as a good little church boy in church three, four times a week, and I'm questioning if God's real, what does that say for the Christmas Easter person? You know, or the person that grew up in church being told that, you know, God slammed, you know, their cousin or brother into a tree and killed him or put cancer on him to teach him something because he needed a new rose for his rose garden. I mean, what about those type of people? And so it really set me on this, on this journey of discovering, or well not, go on this journey of, of endeavoring to discover um, just the realities of the Word of God and, and Him and, and finding out that, hey, there's, there's much more to this thing of Christianity than just being a better person and, and getting to go to heaven. Because really that's what salvation, that's what Christianity has really been kind of watered down and summarized as, is that I get saved, I get born again, I can be a better person, and one day I get to go to heaven. And, and as I started getting to the scripture, because there was just something on the inside of me that hungered for, I knew there had to be something more to it than that. And, you know, I went to Bible school, went to a great, great school, and, and still very well connected there uh, with the people there and the organization and stuff. But even when I was in Bible school, I, I still didn't see a lot. And so after I graduated Bible school, I started digging even further, and I just decided, you know what? Um, I had to make a determination that either what Jesus said was either a truth or it was a lie. And so I made the decision that it was true. And so I basically took everything that I've been taught and learned over the years. I didn't throw it away. I just kind of set it aside. And I went back and just started looking at the words and actions of Jesus. What's he saying? What's he doing? And realizing that when Jesus would make statements like this in John 14, 12, and he said, whoever believes in me will do the very same works and greater works because I'm going to the Father. He had to be telling the truth. And I don't see where he said, you know, the apostle or the prophet or the evangelist or the pastor or the teacher who believes in me. He said, whoever. Well, I identified with that, whoever. You know, I didn't, I always thought I was some little peon anyway. So whoever believes in me, I, that qualified me. And so when I grabbed a hold of that, I was like, okay, this is real. Uh, people that I was talking to were saying, well, that's not really possible, but I'm thinking it has to be possible because Jesus said it. And so I basically started going through and looking at everything Jesus said, everything Jesus did, seeing him as a standard for what is available for the believer, and then taking everything I've been taught 
and running it through the filter of Jesus. And whatever made it through, you know, I kept. And whatever didn't, went in the toilet. Because I want results. I want results and I want, I want what's real. And, and I'm just old enough that I began to, to see the different cycles, the different waves, you know, coming around again and seeing where there's excess and seeing where there's fake and, and all this type of stuff. I just want what's real. And so that's why I absolutely love the miracles and the healings and stuff that we see because, you know, with that, there's just no denying the message that's preached. So case in point, uh, just two weeks ago, I was in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, there was an organization they invited me to come do a youth camp. So I guess they still think I'm cool enough to do youth stuff. Uh, I don't know, I'm pushing 50, but, but they invited me to come do the youth. And so I don't think I'm cool anymore. I don't even know what's cool to wear anymore. I was learning new words from my son, who's uh, 14, going on 15. He was telling me some new words, so I was trying to trying to introduce these words into my speech with these kids just to, to connect. And uh, so that wasn't working real well. So, so I just went to the part that I know. And so we just started talking about uh, Jesus and our union with him. And of course it's teenagers, so I'm really talking about our identity and stuff like that. And so I told them from the very beginning, and I'll, I'll say it just like I'll say it here, is that just get ready because as we begin to put our focus on him, not on us, not on our faith, not on our confession, not on our works, but we get our focus and awareness on Him, that's where miracles begin to happen. And it becomes very normal, it becomes very natural, because that's the way it was supposed to be anyway. And so I began to talk to the kids about this, and we got to probably about, oh, I don't know, maybe about 40 minutes in, and uh, just kind of came up on the inside of me about scoliosis, and so there's about 160 kids in there. I said, hey, is there anybody here, uh, you've got scoliosis, you were born with, you know, you had a curvature in your spine. Well, this young guy raised his hand. I said, what's going on? He said, well, he said, I've had, my, my back's been all jacked up for years and it's caused pain in my, my joints and my hips are, you know, not aligned and all that type of stuff. So I just went over there and I put my hands on his back. And, uh, you know, I, I don't believe in, in doing fake. I'm not about entertainment or anything like that. I, I don't do real good in formal settings and stuff. I'm just, you know, Chad. And so I went over there, put my hands on his back. So while I'm standing behind him, I see him like kind of shaking. Now remember, this is teenagers, okay? So teenagers are all about being cool and trying to fit in. So I, l I love working with kids and teens because they're not putting on any fake. Not like people that come to adult meetings, you know. <laughs> we want to look all spiritual and supernatural. They're not trying to do anything that's going to make them look stupid. But this kid starts to, starts to shake. And so I'm watching that. And so when I took my hands off, I said, what's going on? And, and this is his words. He said, something's moving in my back. He said, I feel my, I feel my back moving. And he said this in front of the kids. And... Uh, and I said, well, explain it to me. He said, he said, when you put your hands on me, he said, I felt this heat come on me. He said, I, feel, I felt something moving in my back. And he said, I, he stood up, he said, I can already feel, he, he said, my hips are lined up. And he said, all the pain, you know, it's in my legs and stuff is gone. And so the next day, uh, they, they got him to take his shirt off and checked everything. His back was straight. And he said he'd been pain-free for the first time in like years. But this is what was cool. So... So he, he's sitting right there, and so I asked, I said, hey, is there anybody else here you got some stuff going on in your body? Well, the girl directly behind him, okay, sitting right behind him, she raised her hand. So what's going on with you? Again, this is teenagers, okay? And she said, well, she said, I had fallen down uh, yesterday. I, I hurt my wrist, and she said, it's been hurting all day. And she said, I just noticed that it's not hurting anymore. She said, but the cool thing is, she said, this morning, I was going on a walk, and it was this really nice campground. She said, I was going on a walk, and, and she said, I was just talking to God, and you know, this girl's probably 14, 15 years old. She said, I was just talking to God, and I told God, I said, God, I don't even know if this healing stuff is real. And if it's real, I'm just asking you to, to, to show me tonight. Now here's this girl who prays this prayer that morning, and here she is sitting right behind this kid, who miraculously, miraculously had his spine straightened up 
and the kids testify, he feels something moving in his back. His hips are lined up, all the pain is gone. So she's telling her that, well, that just touched me. I started kind of tearing up a little bit. And I said, was there anybody else? And all of a sudden, it was like popcorn going off all throughout that room. And for like the next 20, 25 minutes, I mean, we're getting testimony after testimony from kids, and we didn't touch any of them. The only one we touched was a kid with a spine. But all of a sudden, miracles start happening. Healing start happening throughout this auditorium with these kids. There was a 10-year-old little girl that was sitting up here in the front. She had a skin disease all over her body. And uh, at some point, it, dis it disappeared in that moment because she said she looked down and noticed it was all gone. And she had it for as long as she could remember. She said it had been a long time. She's 10, but, you know, been a long time. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, she shared that. And then, then it was really cool. There was an adult that was sitting in the back. And he said, yeah, he said, I did something to my leg. He said, I've had a big growth. Uh, he said, I've had a big growth on the, on the side of my knee. He said, it's been there for a while. I was there when I came in. He said, like, it's, it's gone. Like, it's not even there. And then there was another girl that she said she had broken her femur a couple of years prior. Of course, you know, again, these are all teenagers, and they're saying a long time ago. It's been a couple of years. But she had broken her femur, and so for whatever reason, when it was set, something was going on with surgery. Anyway, it caused her leg to be curved, I mean, uh, twisted. And so her leg was like this, and when she walked... She had to walk like this, the way something happened with her, her broken leg. And so she said that while she was sitting there, she was sitting there in her chair, you know, I guess she's sitting like this, and uh, she said all of a sudden her legs started turning. And she said she looked down and her legs straightened up. But not only did that happen for her, there was another girl that was sitting in the back, and it wasn't her femur, it was her actual foot that she had, something had happened with her foot, and her foot was twisted. Now, I can't do this, but, you know, her leg was straight, but the foot was twisted. And she says she looked down, and her foot started turning. So, I mean, all this stuff was happening with these kids, and we, we didn't pray over any of them. We didn't lay hands on any of them. All we did was talk to them about who they were. And, like, we have been proving this out for, for years now, and, uh, you know, so, so when it comes to the, the typical teaching on healing, it's all about you saying the right thing, you doing the right thing, you know, the formulas, the steps, and the keys. And if you, if you look at the way that it's been taught, the way that it's been taught, in my opinion, uh, is kind of wrong because it's been taught separate from your, your union with him. And so when it's taught separate from your union with him, then all of a sudden you're the one that has to make it happen. And you can call it whatever you want, it still works. You can call it faith, you can call it this, call it that. It, you're still having to, to come up with the right thing to say and the right thing to do. And if you didn't have to do, if you didn't have to be perfect to get saved, you certainly don't have to be perfect to get all the byproducts of your, your salvation. And so, to me, th this message about union, I mean, it really has become... Our message is our foundation of everything, that, of what we teach and, and where everything is taught. Because I, I truly believe that in these last days, we have to get back to the simplicity of the gospel. And the simplicity of the gospel really is this, Christ in you. And if we just get back to that, then it's not really about the person that's standing here. It's about the person that's sitting there. So that it's about the people that you meet out there. Because when you look at the message of healing, it's always been about getting to that person. If you go back and look at every major revival that's taken place over the last 100, 200 years. Thank God for the miracles and stuff like that. But it's still always been about getting to the preacher, male or female. I mean, look at it. You know, William Seymour, the Zeus Street Revival. You've got uh, the 40s and 50s, the healing revival back then. You've got Allen and Jack Coe and and, you know, and then you've got Catherine Kuhlman who came along, you know, 60 to 70. It was always about getting to that person. But we never were designed, salvation never was for you and I to have to go to somebody else to get us what Jesus already got us. But that's the way that's been preached. And that's the way that it's been taught. And so what we're endeavoring to do is fix that. Because if it's being taught from the standpoint that you don't have it, but this is what you need to do to get it then how are you going to take that to the world who doesn't have it? If you don't even think you have it. So how can we actually fulfill the Great Commission? I mean, that's what it really, really comes down to, 
it's the simplicity of this. And yet what I've been finding is it's the simple things that still confounds the wise, even the preachers. Because my, 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 <laughs> my circle is starting to get smaller and smaller and smaller because we're making it simpler and simpler and simpler. And, uh, and it just, I like it simple because it gets the focus off of us. And it's just the perfect combination of faith and grace coming together, the word and the spirit coming together and making this explosive force for God just to show his goodness and his greatness. But you know, we had that happen in Memphis and I'll tell you this other story. This was really, really cool. This actually happened not too far from here. I was in, um, we were in uh, uh, Indiana, and there was a couple that was, uh, this was this was in a, it was a vineyard church that was a former reformed church. So this was a, a real excited bunch of people. And, uh, and there was this, <laughs> there was this couple that was sitting right here on the, on the front row, something in this section. And so we did, gosh, I think we did five or six services over the weekend. And I saw this, I saw the man, he was sitting right there. He's probably, they're probably in their early 60s. And he had blue jean shorts on, plaid shirt, and he had this massive knee brace on. And so at some point during the Saturday night service, I see him doing like this. He's right here on the front, a little distracting, so I'm just looking this way most of the service, you know. I see him doing like this. And so at the end of the service, he comes up to me. He said, Chad, he said, I've got to tell you what happened for me in service. I said, what? He said, well, first of all, I've got to tell you this. He said, me and my wife were Episcopalian. I said, okay. You know? And uh, he said, we happened to see you on Sid Roth several months ago. And he said, we've been watching you know, videos and stuff. And he said, we found out you were here, which is only 30 minutes away from my house. So we came. And he said, so I was sitting there. And he said, now, about 30 years ago, I tore my rotator cuff. And he said, I elected not to have the surgery. And he says, so over years of just continuing to use it, he said, I really just jacked it up. And he said, now, like, I've had no movement in it at all. So he said, like, I had my arm sitting on the chair. To get it there, I had to lift up my arm and put it there. And so if I wanted to move my arm, I had to pick it up. He said, so I was sitting there. And he said, as you were teaching, he said, my, my right leg started to itch. And he said, I just reached down and scratched it and then put my arm back up. <laughs> 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 and, he, and he goes, I looked at my arm and realized I didn't have my arm. And he said, <laughs> and he said, and I'm Episcopalian. He said, like, we don't really believe in this type of stuff. And he said, uh, so then I started thinking about my knee. He said, I really messed my knee up years ago, too, so I have to wear this brace. And he said, so even with the brace, I have, you know, a limp. And he said, I'm still in pain with it. And he said, so I'm sitting there. He said, I started putting pressure on my knee and realizing my knee wasn't hurting. And so he's telling me this story about what happened for him in the service. And this is after service. So as he's telling me this, and we're standing right up here in the front, the, the church, I don't know, it probably had about 300 people. There was a, a set of double doors right back in the middle. All of a sudden, those doors bust open. His wife comes running up the front. Tears coming down her eyes. And she said, Chad, I've got to tell you what just happened. I said, what? She said, look. Now, she was a little heavy set, okay? So she's pulling back, you know, pulling back her, her skin. She said, she said, look, look, look. I said, what? She said, I can touch my chin. I can feel my jawbone. And I said, well, what's the big deal about that? She said, I had like a, a, like a baseball-sized tumor in my neck. She said, I was diagnosed with cancer about six months ago. She said, this tumor's been there the entire time. She said, it dissolved, like, out there, like it's gone, look. So she's freaking out, you know. I've been freaking out, too. She's freaking out, and she's so excited. And uh, so that's Saturday night. On Sunday morning, she comes up to me before the service. She said, Chad, I've got to tell you. She said, I woke up this morning. She said, I had three tumors that were on my back. And she said, when I woke up this morning, they were gone, too. Praise now, I mean, think about this. Didn't lay hands on them, didn't shandai them, didn't spit on them, didn't do anything, didn't get the Holy Ghost shakes, nothing. Like, we're just talking about Him and who we are in Him, getting the focus back on Him, the simplicity of the gospel, Christ in me. 
and all these amazing things start happening. And they're Episcopalian. Okay. And like we, but we've, but we've been seeing this all the time. But what people try to do is they, they want to put it on a gift. They say, well, you know, it's, you're seeing this happening because there's certain gifts in operation. No, no, no. I, I'm not, I'm not putting the focus on a gift or a title or this and that. We're just talking about Jesus, and we're putting the focus back on Jesus. It's not about those things, because the problem is everybody is always looking for an excuse as to why they don't have to experience these things, especially the ministers, and they're the ones that make me mad. Because, because the people I'm around are always looking for excuses, even though we know that this should be producing, instead of humbling ourselves uh, and realizing we're the ones missing it somewhere, somehow, instead of humbling ourselves, we just come up with our own way of blaming God without saying that we're blaming God. So, so you know, people like us, we'll, we'll make fun of the other groups of people who will say, you know, God's teaching me with this sickness, or God's doing this, or doing that. But in our groups, you know, we have our own ways of saying that. It just doesn't sound as bad. Like, you know, I'm just waiting on God to heal me, or I'm waiting on God to manifest it, or, you know, this and that. And it sounds a little bit better, but basically we're still saying the same thing. God's holding out on me. But then we'll sit here and sing, oh, he's a good, good father. You know. But, but then I challenge people, okay, but where's the scripture? Because here's the thing. I'm a stickler for the scripture. I'm all about, you know, the supernatural and the spectacular. I want to experience those things. But you better have scripture for what you're telling me. You know, I've had some wonderful experiences too, but, but there's sometimes I watch some of these people on TV and I'm wondering what they were smoking. <laughs> when they're telling me about, <laughs> about some of my stuff because I'm like, where's the scripture? Because I'm, I'm pretty confident in what I know so far and I can tell you there's nothing to back up what you're saying at all. Either you smoked something or you went really up high trying to pull something out because it's just not, it's not there. So... I want scripture, and I want lots of scripture for it. So you'll find that tonight and tomorrow and tomorrow night and Sunday morning, we're going to go through a lot of scripture. Lots of scripture. Because it has to be a combination of the word. We've got to have the word. Because, because the deal is this. It, if you're all word, if you're just word, 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 you're, you're going to be crusty. All right? You're going to be like a Pharisee. It doesn't matter how much, you know, if it's all just word. But then you can be on the other side where it's all spirit. And then you're just flaky, like just <laughs> weird. You gotta have both. There's gotta be a, a coming together of, of both. And right now in our church world, there's a separation of the two. You got one side that's, that's the word. We know the scriptures. We're so stinking smart with the scriptures. We may not be able to prove it, but man, we can debate you really, really good. And then you got the other side that's so weird and so flaky, they can't back up anything. And then everything goes. And then they weird people out. But if you take the two and combine them and put them together, that's where we can be balanced. You can be very naturally supernatural, not be weird, but still get results. I don't think Jesus was weird. I think he was very normal. And I think you can be very normal too at Walmart or in the grocery store or at the gas station and manifest Jesus and not be a weirdo. So anyway, grab your Bible. Let's turn over to John chapter 14. I, like to, I love the book of John. Spent a lot of time there. Uh, you know, you got Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, those gospels there. But John, he just talks a little bit different. And in the book of John, you really get to see the mindset of Jesus. And so I spent a lot of time uh, going through here, just looking at things that Jesus said, things Jesus did. And these are all going to be pretty familiar passages of Scripture to you. But we'll just start here with John chapter 14 and verse 7. Jesus said, if you've known me, you have known my father also. And from now on, you know him and you have seen him. Now, this is interesting to me because if you remember Jesus, he's not doing life as God. Now, he is God, but he's not doing life as God. He's doing life as a man. Now, if you read this statement here from the standpoint of him saying this and doing life as God, then everybody's okay with it. But if, if you read this statement as Jesus saying this as a man, that kind of freaks people out a little bit. 
Because if he's saying it as God, then, you know, that, that certainly separates us. But if he's saying it like you and I, then that puts us in a position where we have to do something about it. Like it removes your excuse now. But we, you have to remember that everything Jesus is saying and doing, he's doing it as a man. It's not, it doesn't take away from, from him as God, but you've got to stick with the scripture. The scripture tells us multiple times, Philippians chapter 2, it says that Jesus, he humbled himself and came into life as a man. He laid aside everything that gave him an advantage of life. You could say he basically laid aside his godlike abilities. He humbled himself and he came and did life as a man. This is why the Bible tells us, you know, in James it says that God cannot be tempted, right? Cannot be tempted, cannot be tested. But I seem to recall when Jesus was in the wilderness and Jesus was tempted and tested, right? The Bible also says that Jesus was tempted in every way just like us, but he didn't sin. Right, God can't be tempted, but a man can. It says in Luke chapter 2, the child Jesus grew not only in stature, which I'm still trying to do. I'd love to be a, you know, a couple inches taller. Not only grew in stature, but he also grew in wisdom. Well, God doesn't grow in wisdom. He is wisdom. But a man does grow in wisdom. It says the child Jesus grew not only in stature, got bigger physically, but he also grew in wisdom. The Bible says in Acts chapter 10, verse 38, how God anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth. So I love the fact that it points out the natural side, the human side. Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost of power went about doing good and healing all those oppressed by the devil for God was with him. So God doesn't need to be anointed. But a man does. I mean, we could spend time just on this over and over and over and over and over again looking at the, the man side of Jesus. Jesus was doing life as a man. And if he's doing life as a man, then everything he's saying and doing, he's doing it as a man. Every miracle that he did, he did it as a man. Every dead person he raised, every leper that he cleansed, every blind person that he healed, every deaf person that he healed, every devil that was cast out, he did it as a man anointed by God, filled with God, united with God. He did it as a man. And Jesus as a man, united with God, filled with God, perfect, the righteous of God, is sitting here and saying, if you've seen me, you've seen him. Now see, it takes on a totally different perspective when he's sitting there and saying it as God versus him standing there and saying it just like you. Now see, if you talk about it as him saying it's God, everybody's okay with it. You talk, <laughs> you talk about it, him saying it like you and your circle of friends gets a whole lot smaller. But remember, Jesus said it's the narrow road. He didn't say the wide road. So if you're going down the path where everybody is at and everybody's rejoicing and giving you a high five and talking about how great you are, you're probably on the wrong road. So he's saying this as a man. He says, if you've seen me, you've seen who? You've seen the Father. You've seen him. And then I love it, verse 8. Philip says to him, Lord, show us... Show us the Father, and it's sufficient for us. In other words, yeah, Jesus, I heard what you just said, but really, if you'll just show us the Father, we're good. And see, I think a lot of times we forget these are real people. This isn't just a Bible story. These are real people, real emotions, real doubts, real feelings, different perspectives. And here's Jesus with his buddies, with his pals, his ministry partners. They've been together for three years now, hanging out with each other. I mean, they've seen each other sweat. They've seen each other stink. Like they've been hanging out. They've probably heard things, seen things. That the reality of manhood, you know. And Jesus is letting them know, if you've seen me, you've seen him. And Philip goes, yeah, I, really, okay, we're good. I hear that, but yeah, really, if you want to show us God, we're good. I mean, like, can you imagine, like, you go, you, you and your buddies. You're, you're out and you're sitting down for some coffee or you're... You know, ladies, you're out for coffee. Or guys, you're out there and, you know, you're fishing at the lake or something like that. You're just hanging out and all of a sudden you go, hey, guys, I just want to let you know. <laughs> We've been friends for a couple of years now. And I just want to let you know, you know, if you've seen me, been hanging out with me, you've seen God. Now, I mean, think about it. Put yourself in that position. Think about, think about your very, very best friend. You're at the gun range. You're at the lake. You're in the boat. 
you're at the coffee shop, you're at the mall, store, you're hanging out, and they look at you and say, hey man, I know we've been really good, close friends for three years now, and I just want to let you know, just want to let you in on something. You want to see God? Yeah? Well, look at me. If you've seen me, you've seen him. I mean, imagine the reaction you would have. You, I mean, you would think, your, your buddy just came in from, like, I mean, think of it, the, 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 the humanity here, the human side here, and this person that you, you certainly respect, I mean, you've given up everything for, but then he drops this bomb on you and says, if you've seen me, you've seen him. And Philip turns around and says, like, totally disregards what he says, okay, Lord, show us the Father, and that's good for us. And Jesus responds and says, look, have I been with you so long, and yet you still have not known me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen him. So how can you say, show us the Father? Verse 10, underline this. This, this is this, this piece of union here. He said, do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, underline it, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. So see, this statement right here blows holes in pretty much every denominational theology as to why Jesus got miracles. Because you talk to 99.9% .9 of Christians and ask them why Jesus got miracles and they'll say because he was God. And Jesus would say, you're an idiot. No, the reason I got miracles is the Father on the inside of me. Just doing the worst. Jesus did not say the reason I got miracles is because I'm God. He said, it's the Father on the inside of me who does the works. Now you take that statement and you throw that back in the face of almost every single believer. And it literally is like taking a shotgun and blowing over all the sacred cows. Because not only does it take away their belief in as to why Jesus got things, but now all of a sudden it puts them in the very same position to get the very same miracles. Because I still haven't met a, a true Christian yet who does not believe that when I receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, that the Spirit of God, God comes to live on the inside of me. Because every single Christian I've met so far, whether you're Baptist, whether you're Methodist, whether you're Kojic, uh, whether you're Church of God, whether you're Pentecostal, Assembly of God, uh, Baptocostal, whoever you are, everybody believes uh, where Paul says three times to the Corinthians, do you not know, don't you realize that you are the temple of God, the spirit of God dwells on the inside of you. I haven't met a Christian yet who does not believe that God comes to live on the inside of you. Well, if God comes to live on the inside of you and Jesus is saying it's the Father on the inside of me that's doing these things, it puts you in the very same position as Jesus. See, like the simplicity of this is so simple. But what we've done is we've taken the gospel, we've taken the Bible and thrown it out, and we've tried to work with what works in my head instead of what's simply stated. Here, Jesus says the Father on the inside of me that does the works. And notice, so he says... He said, do you not believe that I'm one with the Father, and the Father is in me? And he said, the Father who dwells in me does works. Verse 11, he said, believe me that I am in my Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So this, this tells me right here that when you become one with the Father, and you can say it like this, when God comes to live on the inside of you, it should produce the miraculous in your life. I don't care what your denomination is. It's not about a denomination. It's not about a group. It's not about a stream, a circle. It's about God coming to live on the inside of you. And Jesus said, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. So that tells me very simply that when God comes to live on the inside of you, it should radically change your life. It should radically change your life. I mean, think about it from this standpoint. We're going to get into this tomorrow. But just something for you to chew on and think about it. Shouldn't there really be a, a true difference in the person filled with God and the person filled with the devil? Now, if you ask that question, and you ask that to, to the vast majority of Christians, they'll say, well, yeah, you know, you shouldn't be sinning anymore. Because that's what we have relegated salvation to, not sinning anymore. Or not sinning as much, you know, in some circles. <laughs> I don't cuss as badly anymore. <laughs> That's what we've relegated salvation to is, is being a better person. The not sinning thing anymore. But, but it's 
far, far more than that. Shouldn't somebody that's filled with God be seeing better results in an area than somebody that's filled with the devil? Like, should it change your life? Jesus is letting you know that the one that's on the inside of us is producing the miracles that you're seeing. All the wonderful miracles that we see in, in the Gospels that Jesus performs and Jesus does. The vast majority of the church for centuries has relegated those miracles to the fact that he was God. And if you just go to look at what Jesus said himself about himself, that's not what he's saying. He said, it's because of my union with the Father that the Father on the inside of me is doing all the things that you see. Okay. Don't like that, so you keep reading. Verse 12. <laughs> Verse 12. And he said, then he goes on and he says, most assuredly I say to you, whoever believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. Now see, this is where the rubber hits the road. This is where you find out if you actually believe this stuff or not. Jesus said, whoever believes... So, so I want you to see, see the, the digression, so to speak. You see Jesus, or you see God, you see Jesus. He said, I'm one with the Father. And the Father is one with me. And, and the miracles that you see in my life is because of the Father on the inside of me. And he said, if you'll believe in me, then the same works that you see me doing... You're going to do them too. Why? What was, what was the purpose? Because the purpose of Jesus going to the Father was what? So the Father would come and be on the inside of you. See, Jesus came down so he could lift us up. Or you could say, Jesus came down so he could get God in us. That was the whole point. But see, we've made the point of salvation about us going somewhere. But Jesus made the point of salvation of God, or you could say someone coming to get inside you. See, we've made, we've made the focus of salvation about a change in our destination. But Jesus never says that. Ever. Show me where he says it. I've been waiting a long time now. I've been asking the question to Christians, ministers. Show me where Jesus said the focus, the purpose of salvation was for you to go to heaven. It's not there. I promise you it's not there. But what is there is that the focus of salvation, the purpose of salvation, was to change your position was to get God on the inside of you. That's the focus, and that is all through here. It's all through here. But see, if the focus is just to change in your destination, then why would I expect anything different in my present? If it's all about later. But that's been the focus of, of salvation. And you know, I can prove it to you, because think about when, if you're, if you're part of groups that go out and witness to people and tell people about Jesus, what has been the sales pitch? If you were to die today, brother, would you go to heaven or hell? That's been the sales pitch. And I mean, there's truth to it. I don't want anybody to die and go to hell. I mean, there's some Christians, I wish they'd just go to heaven now. But like, I, I'm telling you, you know it just as well as I do. There's some mean people in church. Just. <laughs> I've been in ministry for 20 years, we pastored for 15 years, and I'm telling you what, if, I, if it wasn't for me having my own personal relationship with God, the Christians in the church would have ran me away. Like, I mean, mean folk, and there's just some of them like, kind of like James and John, Jesus, can we just call fire down out of heaven? And they just go to be with you, because they're causing lots of problems here, but... <laughs> But, but we've made the focus about going somewhere. And you're never going to find Jesus say that. You're never going to find Paul say that. You're never going to find Peter, John, James. Nobody says that. That's not the focus. The focus was not a change in your destination. The focus is about a change in your position. That you were far away from God. And Jesus came to not just get you near him. He came to get you one with him. So that through your union with him, you would produce what he would produce. Oh, but not just, not just what he produced. Then Jesus goes on to take and make one of the most radical statements in the Bible, which I'm having a harder time finding Christians who actually believe it, even ministers who actually believe it, when Jesus goes on to say, not just the same works, but even greater things than I did, you're going to do it too. Now you think about what Jesus said. I mean, that is a radical, crazy, whacked out statement to a degree. That you look at everything that Jesus did on the earth, 
And, and, and the Bible even goes, the, the writers even go on to say, if everything Jesus did was tried to be written down, it would have been contained in the books, you know, at that time. Like, all the stuff that happened, Jesus said, but you're going to do even greater. And I, I truly am, I'm losing friends over believing this statement. People, people that, in my circles, ministers, telling me, you've lost it. Like, no. but it's not just me. The people who believe like me, sadly, it's just believing what Jesus said. Like, now I'm being told I'm extreme. You're extreme. You're just, you're way out there. Why, why, why are you way out there when you're just quoting what Jesus said and saying, I believe that? I don't get that. But see, I'm just a stubborn old little donkey. Like, <laughs> I'm not going to go King James Version on you, but like, I'm a stubborn old little donkey. I don't like being told you can't do that. You can't do something. I've always been that way. I mean, even as a kid, don't tell me I can't do something. Like, if I've set my mind to it, hmm. It's going to happen whether you... But you tell me I can't do it, it's like pouring gas on a fire. Like, I mean, <laughs> I, this was me back when I was seven. Like, I remember my dad. I did something wrong. They called me Bad Chad when I was a kid. I did something wrong. And I, I still remember the room. It was at a house on Pivoto Road in Beaumont, Texas. And I remember I did something bad. My dad, my dad told me to go get the belt. So I only got his belt out of the closet, handed it to him. He told me to bend over. So I put my hands on the, on the bedpost, my, twin little, my little twin bed right there. And he spanked me. He hit me really good with that thing. And I turned around and looked at him at seven years old. And I said, that didn't hurt. <laughs> and he said, this one will. <laughs> so like, I was that kid. I was that kid. Same kid that <laughs> when I was a freshman in high school. You know, so I grew up in Texas. So in Texas, football's king. Like, football's everything. And so I, was, I, I played football uh, up through a portion of high school, but I love basketball, okay? So I'm, I'm like 5'9", so I'm not really tall by any means, but I love basketball. I was, I was really athletic, and so I made up for, for things just with my hustle and, and stuff like that. But so in, in Texas, the athletic director is always the head football coach. And, and this, this particular guy, he didn't get like the guys that played football and basketball because, you know, midway through the season, it starts to interfere a little bit. And so I remember during practice one day, he looked at me and he said, Gonzalez, I don't know why you're playing basketball. You suck at basketball. Why don't you just quit? You'll never make it to college. You've got a really good shot at playing some big time college football. Just quit basketball. Well, that made me mad. And, uh, and he said the same thing to, to one of my really good friends. And so you know what I did that day? I quit. I quit football. He took me off. So I quit to prove to him that I could play basketball. So the rest of that year, I, I sat on the bench because I sucked at basketball. <laughs> but I worked my butt off that year. Worked my butt off that year. I worked my butt off during the summer. And, and that next year, my sophomore year, I made the varsity basketball team. And, uh, and then did really well. And so by the time I graduated, me and that same teammate, we ended up going to play at the same college together. And so our, our, the city that we were in, they had... The, in the newspaper, they did an article about me and my buddy going to play at this, this school. And so when that article came out, I cut it out. I went up to my high school, went to the athletic director's office, and I taped it on the door, and I walked away. Because I was like, do not tell me, because I'll set out the rest of my life to prove to you, you're an idiot. Don't tell me I can't do something. So like, I've always been that way. And so... And it served me well. You know, if you're stubborn, as long as you channel it in the right direction, uh, you're good. And so it's, that's where I'm at now with stuff like this. This is what Jesus said. Either he, either he meant it or he didn't. Either he's a liar or he's a truth teller. I believe that he's a truth teller. So if he told the truth, it has to be possible. Regardless of whether we've seen it or not, that does not change the fact of what he said. That just tells me I'm missing it somewhere. But the fact of the matter is, is that when, when, I, when I grabbed a hold of this years and years ago, it amazed me that as we began to push for this, we started seeing lots of miracles. And all the people who were telling me it's not possible still continued to see no miracles. And Jesus says right here, 
the same things that I did, you're going to do, and even greater things because I'm going to my Father. Well, what was him going to the Father going to produce? Salvation, right? He's going to produce salvation. And if you go on down to verse 19, Jesus says this. He says, a little while longer, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. And I want you to underline this phrase. Remember, we're going to spend time on it tomorrow. He said, because I live, you will live also. Now think about it. He's not, he's not in a cemetery talking to dead people. He's talking to his friends that are physically alive. I mean, imagine this conversation. Because this is one conversation. This is all taking place in the upper room. Right? John chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, and 17 takes place in the upper room. They go up there to have Passover, Lord's Supper, communion, whatever, whatever you want to call it. They're there to do that. And in the same conversation, Jesus not only tells them, if you've seen me, you've seen him. And he not only tells them all the miracles you've seen me do, you're going to do them too. But then he also goes, oh yeah, by the way, you're going to live. Now, I mean, if my best friend looks at me and says, hey, I got good news for you. You're going to become alive. Think about the statements that Jesus is making right now. If you've seen me, you've seen God. All the miracles that you've seen me do, you're going to do them too. And by the way, you're going to become alive. Again, I don't know about you, but I'm thinking my friend is something lost it. These are crazy, crazy statements. But he, Jesus is not saying this with a natural perspective. He's talking about it from a heavenly perspective here. He's talking about truly what salvation is all about. God's going to come to live on the inside of you. You're going to do miracles and you're going to become alive. In other words, your life is about to radically change when God comes to live on the inside of you. But friend, this is not the gospel that's being preached. The gospel that's being preached is if you accept Jesus, he'll, 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 he'll forgive you of your sins and you get to go to heaven. That's the gospel that's being preached. And that's why it's not working too well. Because you and, you and I know very well we can all scare somebody into something. And basically, the sales pitch that we're, we're going out to win people with Jesus is basically from the standpoint of fear, not the goodness of God. Because that's the sales pitch. If you were to die today, are you going to go to heaven or hell? Well, I don't want to go to hell, you know, so I'll accept it. But, you know, after a couple of days later and the fear is gone, I'm back to doing, doing what I was doing before. But what if the sales pitch was something like this, that, hey, would you like to have God live on the inside of you? Would you like to be in a position to, to possibly never make a mistake again? Because God's going to talk to you. You can hear from him. You can see from him. He would lead you in the right direction. Would you like to be in a position that you could potentially never be sick again? I mean, that's, that's a pretty good thing. I mean, like, what if we started presenting the benefits, the actual benefits of salvation versus turn or burn, baby? If you die today, would you burn in hell? But that's what we've been doing. I'm not saying that's not true. But I mean, there's got to be a better sales pitch than that. And I don't know about you, but the scripture says it's the goodness of God. It's the goodness of God that causes men to come and bring them unto repentance. Not, not for fear of turning into a, a human barbecue. I mean, I don't want anybody to go to hell. There is very much the reality of heaven and the reality of hell. But I mean, Jesus didn't present it that way. So he looks at his friends and he says, because I live, you will live also. Verse 20 said, and on that day, you will know, here it is again, this union piece. At that day, the day of salvation, you will know that I am in my father. You are in me and I am in you. So in this conversation, Jesus said, don't you believe, don't you know, don't you realize? If you've seen me, you've seen him. I'm one with him, he's one with me. And because he's one with me, because he lives on the inside of me, these miracles are happening. And, and because of me going to the Father, you're going to do these very same things too. And you're going to become alive. And the same union that I have with him, you're going to have this same union too. This is the gospel message. 
It's so simple, but it's not being talked about. What's being talked about? I, I hear some of my other friends in other denominations of the circles and say, well, I just preach Christ and him crucified. And then when it comes down to telling people about Jesus, I don't want you going to hell. Well, I don't want you going to hell either, but I want you to also understand there's far more to salvation than you just going somewhere. It is literally about the creator of the universe who made you in his very image and in his likeness and sent his son so that because of what the first Adam jacked up, so that the last Adam would come and not only fix and not only restore, but also make it even better so you could be just like him. That is what Jesus came to do, and that is exactly what he's talking about right here. I mean, think about it. In, in, his, in his very last teaching moments with the disciples, I mean, he's about to go to the, to the cross. I don't know about you, but in my, my very last moments with my, my family, my friends, my close ones, I'm not going to be talking about the latest sporting event. I'm not going to be talking about politics. I'm not going to be talking about the president, the government. I'm not going to be talking about any of this stuff. I'm going to be talking to them and telling them the things, the most important things that I know they need to know to be a success in life. I'm not going to be wasting my time on all the stuff that really doesn't matter. I'm going to be giving them the things. I mean, my son Jake, I would pull him to me and I would tell him the most intimate things I know that he needs to know so that he would be a success. And in these very last moments, this is Jesus' really last teaching moments with the disciples in the upper room before they, they, they take communion, Passover, Lord's Supper, whatever you want to call it. And he prays a supernatural prophetic prayer in John 17, crosses the valley, goes into the Garden of Gethsemane, and turns himself over. And over and over and over again, he is talking about union, 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 oneness with the Father, miracles, signs, wonders. That is his conversation with these guys. Because think about it. These guys are supposed to go out and represent him with perfection and do it exactly like he did. Because I live, you will live also. On that day, you'll know that I am my father, you are in me, and I am in you. And whoever has my commandments and keeps them, it's he who loves me. And whoever loves me will be loved by my father, and I will love him and underline it, and I will manifest myself to him. I'll manifest myself to him. Notice he did not say when you get to heaven. He is right now in the context of this. He's talking about when you get born again. He's talking about when you get born again, that miracles can begin to happen. You can begin to have experiences and encounters with God. He said, I'll manifest, I'll, re I'll reveal myself to you. None of these things are being talked about. And yet it's interesting to me that that in spite of that, we still know that it's possible. I'll never forget uh, many years ago, so Jake is 14, so this would, or getting ready to turn 15, so uh, 12 years ago. I'll never forget, we were, we were still in College Station, and uh, it was our first church that we, had, we had started, we were pastoring there. And Jake, he's three years old. And so we're at that stage of we're trying to keep him in his bedroom at night. He's crawling out of his bed. Coming in there, we're going through that whole thing of, you know, I'm scared of the dark, I don't want to be by myself. And so one night he comes in there and he's sitting on the bed and he's crying. And, and Lacey's sitting on one side of the bed and I'm standing up here in the front. And so we're trying to counsel with him and talk to him, trying to get him going to his bed, tell him there's nothing to be scared of. And so we've been doing this for a while. He's just crying and crying. He's not wanting to go to his room. And he's sitting, uh, you know, say that the, this is the back wall. There's a window here. And he's sitting on this side of the bed. And I'm standing here on the, on the corner. He's just crying and got his head down crying. All of a sudden, he stops crying. And he looks up like this and starts smiling. I mean, total change in countenance, just like that. And he's sitting there, he's smiling. And I said, uh, Jake, what's going on? And he said, Daddy, I'm good. I'll go to my bed now. And I said, I said, okay, why? He said, Jesus is here. Now I'm thinking maybe he saw Veggie Tales earlier or something like that. You know, big faith man here, we're pastoring and seeing all these miracles. And, and my, my little boy goes, Jesus is here. I'm like, yeah, whatever. He goes, Jesus is here. But I see this total change in, in, in his countenance. I mean, just, just like that. I said, geez, here. So I thought I'd get real smart. I said, well, um, what's he doing? And he said, he's smiling at me. And I said, well, what's he wearing? 
And he said, he's got a white robe and a big red belt. And I'm, I'm standing here looking at him. I'm thinking, okay, he's seeing Jesus. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes again. He goes, he goes Daddy, I, I, okay, I'll go to bed now. Gets off the bed, goes into his room, crawls in bed, goes to sleep. Now I'm mad because I'm sitting there thinking, okay, my son's seeing Jesus and I'm not seeing squat. Like, obviously he saw something and I, I don't think he was lying. And I'm a little upset. Well, a few weeks later, at our church, uh, after the Sunday morning service, this couple comes up to me. And they said, hey, Chad, can we, um, would you mind if, because you and Lacey maybe have dinner with us. Sometimes we don't want to share something with you. I said, yeah. So they've been coming to our church for maybe about six months. And so we met up. I think they came over to our house like a Thursday night. And uh, so we get kind of through the, the little, you know, formal chit-chat. And then we get down to business. And he said, well, look, he said, what I wanted to share with you is this. He said, you know, we've been coming to church for about six months now. And he said, we've never been real churchy people. He said, we're trying to get better. He said, we don't really talk much about God and Jesus, but we've been doing it more at home and trying to raise our kids right. He said, so last Sunday, or he said, a week ago Sunday, we got home, we're having lunch. And he said, we start talking about church and talking about God and Jesus. And they had a four-year-old little boy. His name was Nicholas. I called him Nick. And he said, I mentioned about Jesus, and Nick goes, yeah, Jesus at church today. And the dad said, what do you mean? Well, see, that means they didn't take them to Jewish church. They decided to keep them out there uh, with them. And the dad said, well, well where, was, where was Jesus? And Nick, little Nick said, he was on the stage with the big people. And the dad said, so the dad's getting real inquisitive now, trying to be smart like I was with Jake. And he said, well, what was Jesus doing? Now, when he told me this, I knew Nick was seeing Jesus. He said, what was he doing? Little Nick, four years old, said this. He said, when the big people lifted up their hands, Jesus reached out his hands. Think about that. When the people were worshiping, surrender, worship, honor, praising him, Jesus was reaching out his hands, extending his hands, giving, releasing, Think about it. Now think about it. Why is it, and, and, and I know we've all heard stories of kids seeing angels and seeing Jesus. And this, why is it the kids and not the adults? Could it possibly be, because some of us have been in church long enough to be told that ain't possible. Been in church long enough to be told that's not normal. That's only for those who have been saved, you know, for 90 years and walking like the dirty old man for the Carol Burnett show and got so wise and serious and the things of God right before they take their last breath, they can have an encounter with God. But it's, <laughs> but it's amazing to me the stories that you hear from these little kids who haven't been churched long enough to be told these things aren't normal. And yet even you have Jesus saying, on that day, you'll know. And it's interesting, this word know, in the Greek, it literally, it literally is the word know talking about like intimacy between a man and a woman, like experiential knowledge, knowing. Not just that in facts, a knowing of my experience, of encounters and experience. He said, you'll know that I am in my Father, the Father's in me, and I am in you. He said, you'll know experiences, encounters. That. And I'm not being weird and goofy with it either. I'm not going around every day and I'm seeing, you know, something. I, what I'm saying is these things are possible. And, and if the more we begin to open up our heart and our mind to these things, is it possible we might start having some actual legit experiences and encounters with God? The thing is that on the inside of every single one of us, we know, we desire, we hear. We may not say it, we may not talk about it for fear of, of sounding and looking weird, but on the inside, we all yearn for something more. And that's why you have all of these other religions, you have all of these sects, all of these cults, all these things. Why? Because even, even the sinner knows there's something greater than me. Even the sinner knows there's something out here that's far greater than what I can see, hear, feel, taste, and touch in this physical realm. And the sad thing is, it's those, it's, it's those ones over there in the devilish stuff that are actually having more experiences in the supernatural than us Christians. And I don't know about you, that should make you mad. 
Because think about it. The same, and I'm not trying to get weird. I'm just, it's just fact. The same, same spirit realm of the demons is the same spirit realm of the angels. It's the same realm. They have access to the dark. We've got access to the light. And if people filled with the devil can have supernatural spiritual experiences, how much more so those that are filled with God have supernatural spiritual experiences and encounters with God. And Jesus is even giving you a clue here and saying, on that day you're going to know. And I'll manifest, I'll reveal myself. I'll manifest myself to you. Now I'm not saying you put your faith on every day you're going to see Jesus. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is he's letting you know there, there's something more than just going to heaven. That there's the possibility of having some heaven experiences while, while we're here. And it all comes down to this very, very simple truth. The Father's in me, I am in him, and I am in you. That you have the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost that's one. And that when they come and they get on the inside of you, it should radically change our life. It should radically change our life. And this is what Jesus came to do. Now, John 14, he's in the upper room. He's talking to him about this. And then in John 17, he begins to pray this supernatural prophetic prayer where he literally prays out what the entire Christian experience is literally supposed to look like. And just for the sake of time, I want you to turn there. And we're not going to look at the whole thing, but I want you to look at uh, John 17 and just start with verse 20. So they're still in the upper room. Same conversation taking place. That was right there in John 14. Same conversation, same guys. Verse 20 he says, I do not pray for these alone. Now remember, he's praying this and the disciples are there with him. They're right there at the table with him. You know, the, the picture we see of, of the long rectangular table and Jesus is there and all the guys are there and the big buffet. All right, right there. Jesus is praying this prayer. He said, I do not pray for these alone, but also I pray for all of those who will believe in me through their word. So he's talking about us. All of us who have believed in him because of the word that was preached. He said, I'm praying for all of those who are to come who is going to believe in me through their word. So all of us that are sitting here, if you've received Jesus Christ, your Lord, say he's praying for us. And Jesus always gets his prayers answered. If there was one person to ever live that would always get every single prayer answered, it would be him. And I want you to notice what Jesus prayed. This is his prayer right before he goes to the garden, turns himself over, and goes to the cross. His prayer is this. Father, I pray that they would all be one, as you, Father, are in me, and I am in you, that they would be one in us, that the world would believe that you sent me. Now, most people, when they have read that, they have tried to take that statement and, and filter it through their little peanut brain and their mind and, and come down to the fact of, okay, he's talking about union from the standpoint of us all getting along. Friend, I hate the burst your bubble. It ain't ever going to happen. I mean, just, just within the Southern Baptist Convention or Southern Baptist Organization, there's like 250, 300 like sub-denominations just within that group. I mean... As a whole, we can't even decide on how you get water baptized. We don't know if it should be in a lake, if it has to be a nice little tub behind there. You know, if you need to do it in the name of Jesus, if you need to do it in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Ghost. We don't know if you need to be sprinkled. We can't figure out if you need to be dunked all the way. Like, we have no clue on this. We can't even get along on that one. We're not all going to get along. But that is not what he is talking about. He said, Father, I pray that they would be one. As you, Father, in me, and I am in them. Now look, if you keep it in context with what Jesus has talked about, it's very simple to see. Because he's making the statement in John 14 about himself and the Father. And then bringing them together, talking about the miracles, talking about the encounters. That they would be one as you, Father, in me, and I am in you. That they would be one in us. That the world would believe that you sent me. Now let me ask you this very, very basic question. And yet it's a, it's, a, it's a question that makes your brain go tilt. How is it possible that the world would see us and by seeing us know that God sent Jesus? This is what he's saying. Father, I pray that you, Father, in me and I am in you, that they would be one in us, that this union us, 
so that the world would believe that you sent me. How is it possible that the world would see us and go, oh yeah, my goodness, God must have sent Jesus. Hasn't happened to me just yet, but, but, I, but it's, it's the statement. What does he say? Because things, friends, think about it. What's he talking about? He's talking about union. He's praying that the same union that he has with the Father, that we would have that too. Now, what did Jesus say in John 14? Right there in the very beginning. Verse 7, 8, 9, 10 there. What do you say? If you've seen me, you've seen him. Do you not believe, Philip, that I'm in the Father and the Father's in me? If you've seen me, you've seen him. Think about it. Do you not believe the Father's in me? I am in him. If you've seen me, you've seen him. That's Jesus' statement about himself. And in this prayer, as he prays for us, he said, Father, I pray that just as you are one with me and I am one with you, that they would be one in us. So when the world sees them, they would see us. Now see, if Jesus made that statement as God, we'll praise him. But if he makes that statement as a man, all of a sudden, it puts me into that very same position to have the same experience, the same perspective, the same results. This is not just about going to heaven. This is about being conformed into the very image of him who created you. And this is not a denominational thing. This is not a charismatic thing, a word of faith thing, a spirit filled. This is not a Bethel thing, a vineyard thing. Name your group. It's nothing about a group. It literally goes back to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26. God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air. Come on. This was God's thing in the very, 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 very beginning. And yet us dumb Christians today have disregarded what Jesus said and we try to make these statements and these beliefs and put it over into this certain little group and say they're weird, they've lost it but when you tell me that you're telling me you forgot literally about what God did in the very beginning His plans and His purposes and pursuits from the very beginning have not changed they are still the same yesterday, today and forever God's plan to make His people like Him not where we can take His place but to be entirely dependent on Him but to be just like Him so we can get results like Him that plan has not changed. The first Adam jacked it up, but the last Adam, Jesus, came to not only restore it, not only fix it, but also make it better. Because see, we've even missed it in that. Because those of us that believe in these things, we, we say it like this, that Jesus came to restore us back to what Adam and Eve had. No, he didn't. He came to make it far better. His friends, think about it. Adam and Eve, they were not one with God. The Bible says that God would come down and he would walk with them in the cool of the day and walk with them and talk with them. And yet if you listen to the prophets of old, the prophets, they begin to prophesy something different, something better, where God says, I will be their God, they will be my people. I will not only walk with them, I will not only talk with them, I will be in them. This is where Jesus said in John chapter 14 and verse 12, whoever believes in me will do not only the same works, but are also going to do greater works. Yeah. Why would greater be available? Because something greater was going to be available. Jesus said, Father, I pray that as you are one with me and I am one with you, they would be one with us, but the world would know that you sent me. Jesus is telling you right now what a real Christian is supposed to look like. Not this man be, pan be, spineless, other things type of people. Someone that would look like him, smell like him, think like him, talk like him, walk like him, get results just like him. So you can literally be on this earth and look at the sinner and say, if you've experienced me, you just experienced him. That is what we are supposed to look like. 
That is the way we're supposed to talk. That is the way we're supposed to see ourselves. But if you talk like that, the vast majority of Christians think not only did you lost your ever-loving mind, they're going to think you were one of the most prideful, arrogant cusses they've ever met in their entire life. And I get it. Because I grew up in church. Just because you're in church doesn't mean they're, they're telling you what Jesus said. So what you have to do is go back and actually look at what Jesus said. And not only does Jesus make that statement. Then in verse 22, he says, and the glory that you gave me, Father, I have given it to them. Why? Underline it. So that they would be one just as. You don't need a doctorate. You don't even need 12th grade to figure out the, the, the phrase just as. What does just as mean? In the very same way. To the very same degree. The same glory that you gave me, I have given it to them so that they would be one just as we are one. See, you cannot come into union with somebody and not share the same stuff. You know, when you get married, and, and what happens? Your stuff becomes their stuff. When you come into covenant with someone, you get their stuff. And yet the church today is, is praying, God, pour out your glory. Jesus said, well, what you gave me, I, I've already given it to them. Isn't it interesting, a lot of things that are actually, if you just, I mean, I hate to bring it up. You just look at Jesus. <laughs> a lot of things that are sung, a lot of the things that are prayed, a lot of the things that are taught. If you literally run it through the filter of Jesus' words, it's actually trash. Because Jesus said, the glory you gave me, I've given it to them. Is it possible that, that the equipment that we've been praying for, Jesus actually gave it to us the moment that God got in you? And, but what was the purpose of that? So that they would be one just as we are one. Notice, this is his prayer before he goes to the cross. And what is he praying for? Not yet once has he said, God, get them to heaven. What's he praying for? What's he asking for? Union, 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 union. Why? Because he's about to leave here. Huh, never thought about this. So, write this down. So, tweet it, and I'm going to put it in my notes in a second. So, think about this. Why, why would Jesus come and do what he did and entrust the ministry to his friends and leave and expect expect the accuracy to go down of the ministry. Basically, why would he come and hand it off for the ministry to go downward? Or you can say, why would, why would Jesus come and do what he did and hand off the ministry and expect it to be less than? Think about, I've never thought about this from this standpoint. Think about, we see, we see it happening a lot in these days that, you know, we've gotten to this this weird thing that we, we think pastors, when they get 60, they're old and they need to retire. So we've got to turn it over to somebody that's 20 and 30 so we can be relevant and reach people. Just, just to the point, you know, we, we can start gaining some wisdom from those who've done it. We give it to, anyway. So, but w w when there's a handoff, we don't expect the church to go down. We expect it to go forward and do better. Think about this. When Jesus hands the ministry off to these knuckleheads, which they really were. I mean, I don't know about you. I never would have picked these guys. Right? I mean, you see what they are. But I mean, but Jesus fully expected that because of their union with him and having the very same equipment, come on, having the very same position, having the very same spirit, that they would not only continue to do what he did, but to do it even better. Who hands off a business and expects it to go down? Who brings in a CEO? I mean, you know, like probably one of the biggest ones as of late was Disney, you know, a year ago. So the CEO that they had came in a couple of years ago. And I mean, the, the suckers just started tanking because, you know, he got all woke and trying to do this stupid stuff. So what do they do? They canned him and they brought in the former CEO to do what? Oh, we want Disney to be worse. So we're going to get a new CEO. No, they want it to, to be better. So they pass the baton. 
Why would Jesus pass the baton of his ministry so that it could tank? Jesus fully expected it to be even better. Watch the next time I, I mention that. I'm... <clears throat> Actually, I'm going to text that to myself just so I don't forget. Because <laughs> that's just too good. Because uh, I'm going to chew on that and when I talk about it, I'm going to make some more people mad. Oops. Be a serious. This is what I do. Why would Jesus turn his ministry over to the disciples and expect it to be less or go downward, period? He fully expected it to be even better. Just like any corporation turning a business over to a new CEO. This is where I get my notes. Right. So... Well, because you notice I don't have any notes. So this, this is the way I treat it, okay? So when we were pastoring, I mean, yeah, I mean, we, we talk about a variety of stuff. So I have notes. But this type of stuff, I treat it like this. That during the week, during my time of the Lord, during my, my driving, my meditating on the lawnmower and doing all that type of stuff and at the office, I'm studying, I'm thinking. And so I just kind of treat it like I'm a sponge, just soaking up during my me time with him. And then when it comes service time, we just by faith squeeze the sponge and, and, and let those things come out. And yet, while we're teaching, I'm learning too. Because I'll be honest, I'm just being transparent. There's times stuff comes out of my mouth, and, and as it comes out of my mouth, it's hitting my head. I'm like, hmm, I never thought about that. And that's one of them. I mean, I've seen it, but I never thought about it like that. Why would Jesus turn it over and expect it to go south? Nobody does that. No ministry, no church, no business turns it over somebody with the expectation that it's going to be less than. It's always with the expectation for it to go forward and be bigger and be better. That's always the expectation. Why would we expect that less in the church? You know why? Because we don't see ourselves as one with him. Here's another statement that gets you kicked out of most churches. We see ourselves as less than them. Now, I'm not saying I'm Jesus. I'm not saying I'm better than Jesus. But if I'm one with them, and I please understand what I'm about to say. I'm not saying I'm equal to him, but I am equal with him. And so are you. There is a vast, listen, that there is a vast difference between being equal to something and being equal with something. Equal to means you can replace it. Right? So my son Jake, he is not equal to me. But he is equal with me. He's got my same last name. He's got my blood in him. If you see him, you know he's my son. I mean, even when we were pastoring our, our, uh, our last church that we, we started in Arkansas, I mean, this boy at 9 and 10 years old would go up to volunteers and tell them they were doing it wrong. Because he knew what everything was supposed to be done. I mean... I mean, hundreds of people, he would go up and tell them, you're doing it wrong. Dad said to do it like this. Or mom said to do it like this. It's supposed to be done like this. And they would do it. But I mean, he saw himself as a representative. But I mean, is that not what an ambassador is? And yet, how many of us Christians, I'm an ambassador for Christ. You don't believe that. Makes a good t-shirt, but you don't believe a lick of it. Because what's an ambassador? You are a legit representative. You're speaking on behalf of the president. You're operating literally from that office, even though you're in another place. Your word carries, it's the same thing. Jesus said, Father, I pray as you are one with me and I am one with you, that they would be one in us, that the world would know that you sent me. And the glory that you gave me, I have given unto them, so they would be one. And then, like if you didn't get it the first time, for the dumb people, he says it the second time, in verse 23, he says, I and them, and you and me, and then underline this, that they would be made perfect in one. So you're not perfect in and of yourself, but once you get in him, you have to be perfect. Because think about this. God, we understand this, we have no problem saying it. God, he is perfect. God is flawless. He is holy. 
He is right. I mean, perfect. All right, we have no problem with that. But how can you become one with a perfect God and you be imperfect? You, you cannot have even the slightest, most minutest flaw and become one with him. Otherwise, you blow up. How can a righteous God come in union to something that even has just the even slightest amount of unrighteousness? Or you say it like this, how can a holy God become one, literally one, with something that has even the slightest little blemish? You can't. For you to come in union with a perfect God, you have to be just as perfect. See, this is what righteousness is really truly all about. And we haven't even, we haven't even plumbed the depths of what righteousness really is all about. Because the furthest that we've gone with, with our statements about righteousness is that, for people that actually want to believe it, the furthest we've gone with it is, well, righteousness gives you the ability to stand before God without guilt or shame. That's been kind of the standard definition. Gives you the ability to stand before God without guilt or shame. But see, the Bible also tells us that we are to go boldly before the throne of grace, find grace and help of a time of need. So you see, a lot of Christians think that when they die, they go before the throne, they're going to fall down on their knees and they're going to grovel and you know. I'm so unworthy, you know, Wayne's world. I'm so unworthy, I'm so unworthy. And when I die and go to heaven, I'm going to slide through the pearly gates and give Peter a high five and say, Woo, thank God I made it. <laughs> but he said, you come boldly before the throne. Why? Because Jesus came down and God raised you up with him and he made you to sit down at his own right hand in heavenly places. Come on, you walk in like a boss, not a slave. That the throne room of God it's not the place where you come and grovel. It's the place where you go and take your seat and you work from. That you pray from. That you minister from. That you fellowship with your father from. And if you can boldly stand before the creator, you can boldly stand before a tumor. If you can boldly stand before God, you can certainly boldly stand before the devil. Come on. You can boldly stand before your father. The perfect one, the holy one, that he is light, he is life, he is righteousness, he is holy. If you can boldly stand before him, you can certainly boldly stand before the curse that you were redeemed from and set free from and transferred out of. But see, we haven't even, we haven't even, we don't even want to think like that. We don't even want to think like I could actually tell the thing that I was delivered from what to do and where to go. But Jesus said, you be made perfect in what? Actually, what's your place right there? Let me show you something real quick. I mean, we all came from this long. We can go. We came from far away. We can take a little bit. Look, hold your place there in John. We're not through there. Hold your place in John. And look over at Hebrews. I just want you to see this thing about perfect. Because some of us, we need to work on this, this perspective that we have of ourselves. There's too many Christians that walk around with a self-esteem problem. There should never be such a thing as a depressed Christian. I mean, not to make people mad, but I mean, you know, you look at what's going on in the world right now and, and all the stuff about mental health and depression and anxiety and this and that. And it's a real thing. I get it. I know people that experience it. I dealt with some things when I was in college. But you know... It's a bad thing that when what's considered normal in the world starts getting normal in the church. Because if you look at what's going on in the church right now, depression's getting normalized, anxiety's getting normalized, grief and sorrow's getting normalized. All these things are getting normalized, and yet at the same time we'll say the, joy, the Lord is muster. And we'll say the peace of God that surpasses all, under, uh, all understanding, mounts guard and garrison around my heart and my mind. We see the scriptures, but we blow them away. We throw it aside because, you know, well... This is what's real in people's lives. There should never be such a thing as a depressed Christian. How could you be depressed when, when you always win? How could you be depressed when he always leads you in triumph? How could you be depressed when I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me? How could you be depressed when you know that, that the victory is already won? How could you be depressed when you've already been set free from the one you're depressed about? I mean, if you just stick with the scripture, it's amazing how our perspective would change. 
And there should never be a Christian who has a self-esteem problem. Now, you see, you talk like that and people think you're being arrogant and prideful. But you ought to see yourself as perfect. I mean, I wouldn't suggest going around telling everybody that all the time. <laughs> but I mean, you need to see yourself that way. When it comes to the things of the curse, when it comes to the things of the devil, you ought to see yourself as perfect. Even when it comes to sickness and disease, you ought to start seeing yourself as perfect. Because the more perfect you start to see yourself, then it starts changing your perspective. And then you start realizing that really, in reality, because I'm perfect, then I'm not the sick trying to get healed. But it's a different perspective. But look at Hebrews chapter 10 and look at verse 12. We're coming right back to John. But Hebrews 10 verse 12 says, But this man, talking about Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God from that time, waiting until his enemies had made his footstool. Underline verse 14. For by one offering he has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. In other words, friends, while you are in the midst of working out your salvation with fear and trembling, he still sees you as perfect. Because none of us in our actions have been perfect. Right? I mean, try using that one on your spouse. Like, <laughs> it's just not going to work. Try it with your boss. It ain't going to work. But in the eyes of God, he sees you and he sees me as absolutely perfect. Why? Because he's not just looking at me. He's seeing me through the blood. He's seeing me. It's in context. He's seeing me through the sacrifice of Jesus. And the sacrifice of Jesus was perfect. And because the sacrifice of Jesus was perfect, I'm perfect. So that even in the midst of my mess, I'm still like the Messiah. Even, even while I'm in the process of being sanctified, even while I'm in the process of being conformed into the image of him who created me, in the eyes of God, I already am. In the eyes of God, he sees me as perfect. And what's the possibility that if I begin to see myself the way that God sees me, that I might actually begin to live a life that's like that. And because of that, then Satan stops dominating. He's forever. So see, even that right there tells me it's not based on my works and my actions. It's not based on me trying to get good enough. How could I try to get good enough afterward when I didn't have to try to get good enough before? See, and this is where we miss it in the area of healing and other issues. If I didn't have to get perfect to get saved, why would my actions have to be perfect to walk in the benefits of salvation? Isn't it interesting we don't make it hard on people to get saved, but we make it hard on Christians? To walk in the blessings of their salvation. In other words, we take all the work off the sinner. And then once you get saved, we put a yoke on your neck. And we come after you with a whip, and we're saying, get to work. Get to work. Get to work. Because you, you need to get good enough. You, you need to say the right thing. You need to do the right things. You need to do this. You need to do that. Here's the formula, the steps, the keys, the one, two, threes, the ABCs. You got all this work to do. But the sinner didn't have to do that to get saved. You didn't have to do that to get saved. It came by grace. That said, you know what? I can't do anything. It has nothing to do with me. It's about everything that you did and all that you are. And we lead people to the cross like that. And then after the cross, we live life like this. <laughs> he says he's perfected forever those who are being sanctified. So forever. That means you can't jack it up. You can't mess it up. Now, I mean, you can certainly walk away from him if you wanted to. You can't mess it up. Why? Because his, his sacrifice was that perfect. He forever perfected you. He forever. So all those times that Satan comes up and tells you, you're not good enough. You need to read another chapter before you can get healed. 
You need to add another sheet you know, of confessions before this can happen, or you need to do this, you need to do that. No, 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 no. He is forever perfect. See, all of those things are they're good spiritual principles we should be doing. We should be reading our Bible. We should be spending time daily praying in tongues. We should be giving. We should be serving. We should be going to church. You should be volunteering. You should be generous in everything that you do. We should be doing these things. We should spend time praising and worshiping Him. But none of those things can get you what Jesus already got you through His sacrifice. Because the moment we start depending on our works to try to get us what Jesus already got us, in reality, how is that any different from any other type of witchcraft? We may call it different things, but if I'm working and I'm depending on other stuff to try to get me that, how am I any different than any other group? Just because my words are different, just because I clothe it different, doesn't make it any different. He said he forever perfected those who are being what? Those who are being sanctified. And then look at Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 23. It says, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven, to God the judge of all, underline it, to the spirits of just men that were made. See, that's talking about your identity. You were made that way. You were made to be perfect. That means you can't work to get there. You were made that way. You were made righteous. Look how many times throughout Scripture it says that you were made. Look in Romans, it says over and over, you were made righteous. You were made righteous. You were made righteous. You were made righteous. You were made. You didn't work yourself up to get to the point of being righteous. He made you that way. He made you that way. And this is what Jesus is talking about over here in John 17. He said, I and them, verse 23, I and them and you and me, that they would be made what? Perfect. They would be made perfect where? In one. That salvation would make you perfect. Salvation would make you right. That your union with him would make you right. Because how could you be in union with a flawless God and you have a flaw? Now, you put, just put, this is why you got to know the scripture. You start putting scripture together. Romans chapter 8, there is no condemnation to those who are Think about it. There's no condemnation to those who are in Christ. Why? Because I'm perfect. How could Satan condemn me? Well, God made me perfect. How could Satan stand there before me and say, you know what? You ain't going to get it yet. You're not good enough. If you just do this, uh, it's a lie from the pit of hell. Because if I'm one with him and he's telling me that I am, if I'm one with him, it's a done deal. I'm perfect. There ain't nothing that I need to do to get me what Jesus already got. And all Satan is trying to do, every time he comes up and tells you, you haven't done enough. It's been the same trick that's been going on since the Garden of Eden. It's the exact same thing that he did with Eve. Just for sake of time, we'll talk about it. We'll, we'll look at it some more tomorrow. But think about the story that most of us already know. In Genesis chapter 3, or Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, God said, let's make man in our image, according to our likeness, right? He said, let's make him to be like us. Genesis chapter 3, you see uh, Satan coming into the garden, and he comes to tempt Eve, right? And the Bible says she's standing there before the tree, and Satan comes up and says, if you'll eat of that fruit, it'll make you like God. And it was the greatest deception. It was the great deception. Why? Because she already was. God had already made her to be like him. But the Bible tells us, Paul tells us that Eve was deceived. In other words, she didn't know who she was. So isn't it interesting that Satan comes and he begins to get her to question her identity? Guys, it's always been about identity. It's always been about identity. Understanding who you are. Look at it. The very first temptation was about identity. The first Adam. 
When Satan comes to tempt the last Adam, what is it about? Identity. If you really are the son of God, is it any wonder that in these last days, the biggest thing right now is about identity? And yet it is at the most basic of the basic of all, and that you can't even look in a mirror and tell if you're a boy or a girl. But if you can't even look at your physical exterior to tell you if you're a boy or a girl, you're going to have an extremely hard time disregarding what you see in the mirror and knowing that you are just like God. It's about identity. And Satan comes to Eve and says, if you'll do this, if you'll eat of this fruit, if you'll do this, you'll become like God. It'll make you wise like God. You'll become like God. And it's very, very interesting because in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 5, it makes this statement. When she saw that that fruit was good for food, make her like him. When she saw, this was not the first time that she saw the tree. It's right there in the middle of the garden. She's seeing this bad boy every day. But what happened? She saw it differently here. And that instant, in that moment, because of listening to that temptation, those words, those thoughts and ideas and suggestions, all of a sudden she saw it differently. She saw it differently in her imagination. And she saw it differently. And what did she do? She reached out and worked to get what she already was. And as a result of not knowing what she was, and now working to get what she already was, she lost out on who she was. It was a great deception. Why? Satan had no authority over her at all. So what did he do? He had to bring a thought. He had to bring an idea. He had to bring a deception. He had to get her... To lose out on herself. So he got her to work to get what she already was. And as a result, she lost what she already had. Is it possible that you and I are in the same boat today? Because we've been redeemed from the curse law. We've been transferred and taken out of the kingdom of darkness and brought to the kingdom of light. Colossians, come on, chapter 1. It's right there. We were taken out of that. We're, you see in Romans chapter 6, we're no longer the slave. We're the master. The roles were reversed. But how many Christians are still in that place? They've been made the master. They've been, they've been placed into to the, the kingdom of his dear son. The chains have been taken off. They're the ones with authority, but they don't know who they are. And so because they don't know who they are, Satan's sitting there and saying, if you'll just do this, you'll get it. If you'll just do this, if you'll just follow this formula, if you'll just do these steps, you'll get it. And is it possible we've got a whole bunch of Christians today that are working and working and working and working and working, trying to get what they actually already have? And because they don't know it, actually losing out on what they already have. Because we don't realize we're perfect. If you're perfect, that means you're not missing anything, Jack. <laughs> If you're perfect, that means nothing missing, nothing broken, absolute perfect. Is it possible? I mean, is it just slightly possible that what Peter said in 1 Peter 2.24 is actually true? That you having died to sin so you could live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Is it actually possible that the moment you get born again, you actually are made the healed of the Lord. But because you're not told you already got it. Instead, we're taught when it comes to healing, we're taught how to get it. Not what you already have. And is it possible while we're working to try to get what we don't think we have, we're actually losing out on what we already were given. But that's just a chew on. That's not for the night. So... So finish up right here, John 17. I won't keep you much longer. John 17. He said, I and them and you and me, that they would be made perfect in one, that the world would know, here it is again, he says it again, that the world would know that you sent me. For the second time, in like five seconds, Jesus repeats himself. Union, for what purpose? That the world would see them and know that you sent me. Jesus fully expected salvation to put you and I in a position that when the world encountered us, they encountered him. That when the world experienced us, they experienced him. That you and I would be in the very same position that we only do 
what we see the Father do. We only say what we hear the Father say. That our sensitivity to His voice will be just like His. Now, I mean, am I there yet? No. Have I seen glimpses of it? Yeah. But am I, am I there 24-7? Not yet. But is it possible? Absolutely. And if it's possible, that means we can go after it. That means when I mess up, I put it under the blood, and I keep on going. Because why? Because now I'm beginning to see the standard that Jesus actually set for me. See, thank God for, for all those that have come before us, you know, the, the John Lakes and the Wigglesworths and the Coolmans and the Seymours. And, you know, thank God for all those people. And thank God for all those that are on the earth today. But they're not my standard. They're great examples to show us possibilities. But they're not my reality. Jesus is my reality. He's my standard. He said, whoever believes in me will do the same works. But then you're going to do even greater works. So in reality, what Jesus was saying is, and this will get you, <laughs> this will get you kicked out of a lot of places too. It's just what Jesus said. In reality, Jesus is saying this. What you saw me do on the earth is the minimum for what the church should be doing today. Yet if you listen to most Christians today, we would think that what Jesus did on the earth is the max. I mean, if it's even attainable, it would be the max. But Jesus is letting you know it's the minimum. And see, that changes the perspective on everything. It's the minimum. Why is it the minimum? Think about it. Why is it the minimum? Because Jesus lets us in and clues us in on some things, and nobody's talking about it. Because in this very same prayer in John 17, Jesus makes this statement. He said, Father, restore to me the glory that I had before. So think about it. That means what Jesus was walking in on the earth was less than what he had before. I mean, you don't need a theology degree. It's exactly what he says. Give me what I had before. It was better. So that shows you that everything Jesus did with what was, was with a lesser glory than what was available. Oh, so well, oh you think that's something? Let's go a little further. <laughs> I'm telling you, if you just stick with what he said, if you just look at what he, what he said, this is not a denominational thing. If you just look at what he said and then just, just make... Make the stance that I'm going to believe what he said. And I'm going to go after it. Because not only does he say, Father, restore to me the glory that I had before. He also says this. We see in, in, in Luke chapter 9 when he sends the 12 disciples out. He says, I give you power and authority over all sickness, all disease, all demons. All right? And then the ministry gets a little bit bigger. He sends out the, the 70. And he says, I give you power and authority, all sickness, all disease, all demons. Then, on the day that Jesus arises from the dead, with the keys of death, hell, and the grave, for the very, very first time, he stands before everyone and says, Now all power and all authority in heaven and in earth is now mine. So not only was Jesus operating in a lesser glory, he was also operating with a lesser power and a lesser authority. Oh, wait, and let's, let's don't forget this one. He was operating under the old covenant. That was based on, had lesser promises and based on the blood of bulls and goats. So when you put things in perspective, now on this side of the cross, on this side of redemption, you start pulling scriptures out like this. 1 John 4, 17, as he is, as he is. Yes. 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 No, no, so, so, so see, 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 look, there, here's the thing. I'm not identifying with Jesus who walked on the earth. That's a dead man. I'm identifying with the glorified Christ. That's the one that you and I are one with. Not Jesus who walked. I'm not one with him. I'm one with the one seated at the right hand of God. That's who I'm one with. Yes. Come on, guys. If you just put the puzzle pieces together, it's right there. We're not pulling stuff out of our butt here just to make something sound good. 
It's, it's literally right there. It's scripture. It's right there. I mean, these are Jesus' his, his statements. And this is why it's so important. you got to know the scripture, too. It, 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 yes, we want to go after things and spirit, but you got to have the scripture, too, to back up what you're saying. But I found this, guys. If there is a truth in the word, you don't have to go searching really hard and pull it, pull this little scripture and half of this and a quarter of this and try to put all these things together and try to prove something. If there's a truth in the Bible, there's a truth God's wanting to get, a, get across to you. It's going to be all through there. And Jesus is making these statements. He's giving you the pieces of the puzzle. You just got to put them together. I'm not, I'm not identifying with the man who walked on the earth. I'm identifying with the glorified Christ. And this is why Jesus said, whoever believes in me is not only going to do the same, but you could actually go so far as to say this, the lesser. Whoever believes in me is not only do the same, but is also going to do greater. Why? Because then, after salvation, there is a greater glory, there is a greater authority, there is a greater power available. And, based on what we see in Hebrews, there is also a better covenant with better promises that's not based on the blood of bulls and goats. It's based and established on the blood of Jesus Christ. We're not operating under the old covenant. We're operating under a better covenant that is established and ratified by the blood of Jesus and being held together by the one who's seated at the right hand of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. And when you begin to understand who you are in Him, do not tell me that Jesus can't outdo Himself through you. And this is where people have an issue and say, who, who do you think? Well, I watch because, you know, in, in the South, hell ain't a bad word. It's just a place. But who do you think you are to say you could do better than Jesus? See, if you're making that statement, you have a problem with it. You're looking at this and not me. Because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17, we see where it says, Paul makes this statement. If any man be in Christ, be in Christ, he becomes a brand new creation, brand new creature. Old things have passed away, all things have become new. But if you read the verse before that, he says, we do not look at men like we used to look at them. We, we looked at them in the flesh, now we look at them in Christ. Why? If you have a problem with it, you're looking at the flesh, because in the flesh, this is limited. This body, this house is limited. But, but if you're looking at this, you're always going to be inadequate, and you're always going to be condemned. You've got to see who you are. You are a spirit being made in the very image and likeness of God. You're one yes. with the glorified Christ. And friends, if you have a problem with it, you think Jesus is dead. He's very much alive. And I certainly think he can outdo himself. But this is where things got better. Because the Bible even says if Satan would have known what was going to happen, he would not have crucified the Christ. Because what happened was it went from being one Christ to a whole bunch of them. And yet it wasn't supposed to be where we would go out and do lesser than. Why would, oh, I never thought about this too. Why would Satan have regretted it if the organization was going to be doing less than what it did before? Let me write that one down. <laughs> Why would Satan have crucified Christ and regretted, it, and regretted it if it was supposed to be less than what it was before? I'm sending this to a friend of mine. They're going to wonder what the heck's going on. <laughs> but think, why would he have regretted it if we were doing less? Why? Because this thing was supposed to come on. This thing was supposed to be bigger. It was supposed to be better. It was supposed to be better. Why? Because now the Christ, with all power, all authority, all glory, is not limited to one body. He's got billions of bodies where he can do the very same thing through. Let me give you one last one to chew on. Romans chapter 6. And we are going to spend some time digging in Romans chapter 6 tomorrow. Romans chapter 6. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4. See, this is where salvation gets exciting. Yeah. This is where Christianity starts to take on a whole other type of meaning. 
that it's not just about going to heaven. Now, I'll give you this. In John 17, after Jesus makes those, those three statements about union, 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 the glory, then he goes on and says, And Father, I pray that they would be where, with me where I am. And then he goes right back into the union piece. And the very last statement that he makes in that prayer, John 17, before he goes into the garden, turns himself over, the very last thing that he prays, he says, And Father, I pray that I would be in them. It's the very last thing that he says. The very last thing that I would be in them. And yet, isn't it interesting, Colossians chapter 1 and verse 27 says, The mystery of the ages. The mystery that had been held back. The mystery of this gospel, this almost too good to be true news, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the mystery of it was what? Christ in you. Oh, but don't forget about that last phrase. The hope, and that word hope literally means expectation. The hope, the expectation of the glory of God. Why could I expect the glory of God to be manifest in my life? Because of the Christ on the inside of me. His glory manifest in my life. Is it possible when we showed up in church and we showed up in service, instead of waiting for God to pour out His glory, we began to realize what was on the inside of us and it began to pour out of us? Oh, think about this one. Because Jesus said as it, as it is in the days of Noah, it will be in the day when He returns. Yet if you go back and you look at it in the days of Noah, what happened before the rain came down? It says the waters of the deep were broken up. What's the possibility that the glory of God that's resident on the inside of every single believer, that at one point in these last days when we begin to understand who we are, that the deep things, the depths of who we are will begin to get broken up and the glory of God begins to shine forth and flow forth and flood forth from all of us. And as the waters cover the deep, the glory of the Lord will flow forth from the believer and cover the face of the earth. That is good. <laughs> We're going to write that one down too. <laughs> I'm telling you, I, I do it. It sounds conceited. I don't mean that. I go back and I take notes. Because I'm telling you, stuff. Because that's the thing, man. You just start tapping into some of these things. You let the Holy Ghost just begin to talk. Get your mind out of the way. Get your, get, your, get your little stupid self out of the way. And let him just talk. It's amazing the revelation that starts coming forth. So we'll end here. Romans chapter 6 verse 4. He said, therefore we were buried with him through baptism into death. Underline this. Highlight it. Put asterisks, exclamation points. That just as. Here's that phrase again. This is the phrase that gets you kicked out of church. Just as. Just at, see, this is what we're endeavoring to do. To raise up a new breed of believers, a new breed of Christian who understands who they are, who understands what they have, who understands everything that God has done in them, God has done for them, all He's endeavoring to do through them in Christ. They get a body of believers, a group of a, a new breed, a, a, an army of believers that understands who they are. That understands who they are. That understands who they are. And be the ones that literally brings him back. Yes. That's what I believe is taking place right now. That this great revival, this, this, this great last day awakening that's been prayed for and, and been fasted for and been sung for. I truly believe that we, we're already in the, in, in, in the some footsteps of it. We're already in a little bit of, you know, a little bit of a pitter patter of a rain for it. But not because God's withholding. Because we start figuring out who we are. We start figuring out what we have and we start taking steps. See, everybody's praying for a move of God and forgot that when God moved on the inside of you, you became the move. And so if you want to experience the move of God, you need to get off your butt and you need to start moving. And moving. Come on, Colossians chapter 2 and verse 6. Paul says this. He says, as you have received him, now walk in him. Walk in him. Walk in him. Walk in him. He said in Acts chapter 17 and verse 28, it is in him that we live and we move and we have our being. 
Come on, we're sitting there twirling our thumbs, waiting on God to do something. But how can He do something that He already did? He gave you everything. Yeah. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, God, He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. Why do we act like God is withholding when He gave you everything heaven had to offer in Him? That means every, literally everywhere that I go, I've got all of heaven's resources available to me. And yet the church isn't praying the way that Paul prayed. The church is praying, God, give us that dead raising power. God, give us that power. God, give us this. God, give us that. And yet the Apostle Paul in Ephesians chapter 1, 15 through 21 says, Father, I pray you'd open up their eyes. You would help them to see and understand. Give them wisdom and revelation, the knowledge of you, that the eyes of their understanding, that word understanding literally is the word imagination, that the eyes of their imagination would be filled with light, that they would know the plan that you have for them. They'd know the inheritance that you have in the saints, and they would know the exceeding greatness of your power, which you exerted when you raised up Christ from the dead, that is not only for them, it is also in them. Paul was not praying for God to give you that dead raising power. Paul was praying for God to open your eyes to help you understand you already have that dead raising power. But the church today is saying, oh God, I don't have enough. God, give it to me. God, give it to me. It's almost like, God, if you would love people like, like I love people, you would give us what's needed to win the world. Now, nobody's saying that from the pulpit, but they are saying that. They're not saying it that way. They're spinning it where it sounds a whole lot better. But that is literally what people mean right now. God, if you would just give us this. If you would give it. But isn't it interesting? The early church didn't pray that way. Oh, that's my friend responding back. <laughs> the early church didn't pray that way. The early church actually believed that salvation and the baptism of the Holy Ghost was enough to turn the world upside down. The early church wasn't praying for a revival. They were starting it. Yes. The early church wasn't waiting for a great awakening. Why? There wasn't anything to awaken. And in reality, the way that we talk about these things, the way we talk about revival, the way we talk about this awakening, it's like we talk about that God's going to give us something He hasn't already given us. Where's that in the Scripture? No. If you, if you look back at the history of revival or awakening, whatever you want to call it, all it is is God stirring up what's already been there the entire time. Paul told Timothy, stir up the gift. Come on, a lot of us are like, like, like some, some white milk that, you know, we got that Hershey syrup that got poured in there. And the syrup is there. But it hadn't been stirred up. And we're, we're praying for God, give me that syrup. <laughs> give me that chocolate. But maybe, just maybe, it's already there. And you just haven't stirred it up. But it literally is the way that we have treated God. I love people more than you do. And if you would just give us that. But have you ever thought about this? If, if, there, if there actually was something, I'm not saying I'm right, I don't think I'm wrong, but I'm not saying I'm right. <laughs> If there, <laughs> that's me and my humility. But if there was something that God could give us that would win people to Him, something He'd been withholding, don't you think all those people that's died and gone to hell over all these centuries could have used that too? That doesn't sound like a just, loving God. Doesn't sound like a loving God at all. If there was something He could have given us that would 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 have won other people. I don't see anywhere in the scripture, nowhere, where it says that he withheld anything and there's something else to go get. So you'll find this. There's a big difference between Jesus and Paul and their teaching. Before, before the cross, before redemption, Jesus is telling people, believe, 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 believe. But on the other side of the cross, Paul is telling people, walk in it. As you've received help. Come on. All that heaven has to offer in Christ. As you have received him, as you have received him, now walk in it. Now enjoy it. Now use it. What's the possibility if we change this gospel message and we stop teaching people how to receive and we start teaching people how to release? 
Because see, if you're always in receive mode, it's because you don't have it. But if you're in release mode, it's because you've got it. What's the possibility that the thing I've been waiting to receive of, I actually already have it. And I could have been releasing it. But I'm standing there just like Eve, being told, you don't have it, but this is what you need to do to get it. And the whole time I'm waiting to get it, I could have been releasing what I already have. See, this is, the, this is the whole message throughout the New Testament. It's the whole message that Paul's telling the church, telling the people, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ, in Christ. Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. For the life I live in this flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who died and gave his life for me. I will not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness comes by the law, come on, it's always about who you are in him. And if I am perfect in him, how can I be missing anything? How can I be lacking anything? How can God be withholding anything? And yet Paul says this, again, we're trying to finish up right here. Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, underline this phrase, even so. Just as, even so. Just as, even so. Come on. It's putting you on his same level. It's not putting you in a position where we replace him. If you think you can replace him, you're an idiot. He's the vine. We are the branch. We are entirely dependent on him. But Jesus is the one who connected us to him so that he could flow through us. And then we turn around and we give him all the credit. Jesus said in John 15, I am the vine and you are the branch. If I abide in you, you abide in me, you will produce much fruit. Where does the fruit come from? Not from your working, but from your abiding and your union with him. And yet Paul makes this statement right here. He said, just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in a new type of life. What type of life are we to be living? What new type of life? The same life he lives right now. Not the life he lives. The life he lives. That's a good one. Too. <laughs> Not the life he lives. But the life he lives. I'm sorry everyone's laughing at me, but I don't have a pen in my notepad. So I'm using my text messages to send notes of things from the service. <laughs> so this right here, th this part right here in Romans chapter 6, this is where we're going to spend some time tomorrow. I've been chewing on this and chewing on this and chewing on this for a while now. And I'm telling you, this chapter right here is one of the, the greatest little exposés on redemption. And truly what we, are, what we are supposed to be, what we're supposed to be experiencing. I'm telling you, there's marvelous truths here in comparing to what a dead man is like and what an alive man is like. Because remember, remember what Jesus told the disciples, and this is my last day. Remember what Jesus told the disciples. Because I live, you will live also. And there is a vast difference between someone that's dead and someone that's alive. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you for the Holy Spirit, the revealer of truth that leads us and guides us and directs us. Father, I pray for every single one of us that are here and those that are watching online, those that will watch this video later on. I pray exactly what Paul prayed for, for the church. Father, you would open up our eyes and help us to see things we've never seen before. You'd give us wisdom and revelation and knowledge of you. That the eyes of our understanding, our imagination, our soul would be filled and flooded with light. That we would see the great, tremendous plan that you have for us. We would understand the tremendous inheritance that you have in the saints. And we would grasp and understand and grab a hold of our understanding 
of that exceeding great power that you exerted when you raised up Jesus from the dead, that we would understand with great depth and great understanding that it is for us, that it is in us. That power that you exerted when you raised him up. When you raised him up. And that we are the fullness of him that fills all in all. You are the fullness of him that fills all in all. You are the fullness of him. You're the fullness of him. The fullness of him. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9 and 10. Verse 9, it says that Jesus is the fullness of the Godhead bodily. The Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost wrapped up in a body. And then in verse 10, he said, you are complete in him. And yet that was Paul's prayer for the church that you would understand. You are the fullness of him that fills all and all. That everywhere you go, you are literally walking around as Christ on the earth. You are the fullness of hell. It's in him that we move, in him that we live, in him that we have our being. It is in him that the world sees us and experiences him and encounters him and experiences his healing power through us, experiences his redemptive power through us, experiences his love and his grace through us. Because we are the body of Christ. We are your hands and we are your feet. We are your body. Come on, friends, how many times have we heard, you may be the only Jesus someone ever sees. And yet we relegate it to this, this small, little, petty little thing of Christianity of not sinning anymore. But what's the possibility that you might be the only Jesus someone ever sees and they've been given a death sentence by the doctor and they have no hope, no way out, but you're the carrier of the Christ, a carrier and a possessor of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, His light and His life. And you may be the only Jesus they ever experience. You may be the only carrier of His power that they ever experience. You may be the only encounter they ever have of the glory of the goodness and kindness of God. And that through you, they not only experience His forgiveness, they'd also experience the goodness and power of His love. The goodness and power of His healing power. The goodness and the power of His cleansing, redemptive power. That you would literally be the hands and the feet of Jesus. That when people touch your hands, it's literally like touching his hands. That when your words come out of your mouth, that it's his words coming out of your mouth. And his words producing, just like his words produce on the earth. And just like his words produce out of heaven. That you literally are his representative. You are his ambassador on the earth for the world to experience and encounter him in the fullness. Because he has not withheld anything back from you. Because he wants the world to know him. But they're going to know him by knowing you. God has not withheld anything from the church to reach the world. It's not like he's sending an army into the world but didn't give them the equipment they needed. God sent us into the world fully equipped. He sent us into the world fully supplied. That's why Jesus said in John 17, Father, as you sent me into this world, I have sent them into this world. God did not send Jesus ill-equipped, so Jesus did not send us ill-equipped. God did not send Jesus into the world with the things that he, he, he needed and gave it in a lacking manner. No, in the very same way that God sent Jesus with everything that he would need. Yeah. Jesus, in the very same way, sent us into the world with everything that we would need to reach the world and get the job done. And do it exactly like him. We have sold ourselves short in our salvation. Because we have looked at salvation through the eyes of a man. Instead of looking at salvation through the eyes of our king. We have looked at salvation through earthly eyes. 
instead of heavenly eyes. We have looked at salvation through the eyes of a sinner. A sinner's mindset instead of looking to, at salvation through the eyes of a redeemed man seated at the right hand of God. There is so much more available, not because God is withholding, not because God is holding out, but because we have not understood who we are and what we have. We do not have an equipment problem. We have an awareness problem. We don't have a faith problem. We have a consciousness problem, an awareness problem. We don't know who we are. But the more we begin to understand who we are, the more the world we will begin to experience Him. Father, I thank you for revelation. Thank you for the Holy Spirit that leads us and guides us and directs us. Father, we humble ourselves before you right now. We thank you for an outpouring of revelation and insight and understanding into you, your word, and your ways. So that we would represent you with perfection. So the world would see you the way that you truly are through us. We love you and we praise you. We thank you for being in the position that you have put us in. We thank you for the honor. We thank you for the honor to be saved for this very last days. That you saved us for last. You could have saved Moses. You could have saved Paul. You could have saved Lake and Wigglesworth and Roberts and Hagen and Coleman and Seymour. You could have saved Elijah. You could have saved Joshua. But you saved us for last. And I thank you for the privilege to stand before all of heaven, the great cloud of witnesses, reaching over and looking over the banister of heaven, looking through that veil of glory and seeing us standing here today. And cheering us on, knowing that we've got everything that we need. And watching us to see us fulfill what has been prophesied for thousands and thousands and thousands of years. And yet we get to be the ones to be at the culmination of this thing and to bring our king here so our king can take us out. Thank you, Father, for saving us that. Thank you for trusting us. Thank you for trusting us. We will not let you down. Through the midst of the adversity, through the midst of the trials, through the midst of the fires, through the midst of the storms, through the midst of the criticisms, we will march on and we will march on and we will march on and we will march on down that very, very, very narrow road. In the midst of the criticism, in the midst of the jeers, we will do it for the joy that is set before us. That crown that's set before us. To stand before you on that precious day. To say, well done, my good, my faithful servant. You took me at my words. 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 Me at my words. And you went after me. Thank you, precious Jesus. It's a privilege to stand before you and represent you today. All those that are sitting here, every single believer that would believe in you, that we would prove the naysayers wrong, we would prove the religious people wrong, that in these last days that we stand, where there's been questions, where there's been doubts, whether it's been concerns, whether there's been wonderings, Father, that we would do this thing, we would make it look exactly like you. And yet we would do it with all humility, that with every single miracle, every single sign, every single wonder, every single healing, every single deliverance, every single salvation, 
Every blind eye, deaf ear, tumor dissolved, missing limb that grows back, every missing tooth that grows back, every skin disease that's dissolved, every cancer that's healed, that every single time you get all the glory, you get all the honor, you get all the praise, and every single time we turn it right back unto you. And you get the praise for what you did through us. Praise you, Father. We love you and we praise you and we thank you for your goodness and your graciousness in our lives. In Jesus' name.